Substitute decision-making is a generic term that is applied to various types of legal authority that confer the power on one person to make binding financial, health care, or other decisions for another person. These include guardianship, financial powers of attorney, health care advance directives, mental health care advance directives, health care representatives, representative payees, and trusts. Substitute decision-making is sometimes called surrogate decision-making, and the people who have the authority to make decisions for other individuals are generally called surrogates. You are watching one in a series of videos on substitute decision-making by the Disability Rights Network of Pennsylvania and the Developmental Disabilities Council. The people who appear in these videos are individuals with disabilities, family members, and advocates who are interested in and impacted by these issues. This video addresses common questions relating to healthcare substitute decision making. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. My name is Mark Murphy and I'm an attorney with the Disability Rights Network of Pennsylvania and we're here to talk about substituted decision making in the healthcare context. Uh, that's a, an important area and one that is likely to impact uh, all of us at one time or another in our lives, so it's important that uh, we all have good information so we can make the best decisions when it comes to healthcare decisions. So um, why don't we get started, and who wants to ask the first question? Do people with cognitive disabilities have their own right to make their own healthcare decisions? All people with disabilities, whether they're cognitive disabilities, intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities, it doesn't matter what kind of disability, all people with disabilities have the right to be involved in their health care decisions and all decisions in their lives to the maximum extent possible. So yes, uh, people with uh, intellectual disabilities should be involved in their own health care decision making. They have the right to uh, uh, agree to medical treatment. They have the right to refuse to consent to their own medical treatment. Uh, if, if it's done in an informed way and it's done in a voluntary way and we're going to talk about what all that means but people with disabilities absolutely have to be involved to the maximum extent possible in the, their own health care decision making. So there are health care decisions to which individuals with significant cognitive disabilities could still make decisions and give consent. Yes, they, they are. And a lot of people sometimes ask that question because they think that people with significant disabilities can't be involved uh, uh, in, in their own health care decision making, but in many cases they can. Uh, there's a concept known as simple consent, which means consent to uh, procedures that are really no more uh, dangerous or no more risky than uh, the risk that occurs in your average daily life. And so those would be something like a, a, a simple test, blood being drawn, or visiting a doctor for a routine um, uh, physical checkup, for example. So people, even with significant cognitive disabilities, often can give what's known as simple consent to those types of procedures. So it should never be presumed that because somebody has a significant intellectual or cognitive disability that they're unable to make uh, medical decisions for themselves. It really has to be looked at on an individual by individual basis. When is simple consent not enough? Simple consent won't be enough when the medical procedure at issue or the medical test or whatever is involved is more complicated than a procedure that is no more risky than somebody might incur in their daily life. You know, a good example of that would be something like surgery, uh, something that's invasive into your body, uh, maybe treatment for cancer, something on a more serious level. So that type of procedure requires what's known as informed consent. And informed consent means that the individual with a disability after being told uh, the, the, the risks, the benefits, the alternatives, all the necessary information is able to then um, make a decision. And that would be required after, for example, the information is given to them in a way that they understand, in language that they understand. Uh, and the, the concepts, if possible, are uh, simplified if that's what's necessary. But informed consent is a higher level of consent than simple consent, and therefore it's necessary for uh, more complicated types of medical procedures. How do you know if a person is able to give informed consent? Well, again, what happens is the medical provider will sit down with somebody and using any types of uh, necessary changes in language, any type of communication support that the person might need, explains to them in a way that they're best able to understand uh, the risks that are involved, the benefits that will come from the medical procedure. Are there alternatives that need to be, that need to be looked at? 
uh, and after all that information is given to the individual, then a decision is made about whether the person can give informed consent. And a, and a way to measure that is, is the individual, for example, able to communicate that information back to the health care provider? Again, using language that they're comfortable with and using any supports that are necessary, is it clear that the person is making that informed choice, that they do, in fact, understand the risk, the benefits, and the alternatives? Can an individual be capable of giving informed consent sometimes, but not others? Well, that's a good question, because a lot of people think uh, you know, consent is all yes or all no. And in fact, depending on the individual, there are many things that you may be able to give consent to, and not just simple consent, as I've said. Even in the informed consent context, obviously some medical procedures are more complicated than others, and some are very complicated, and we have a lot of um, information that needs to be imparted. But basically, an individual has to be looked at on a case-by-case, decision-by-decision basis. And so a person with an intellectual disability may be able to give informed consent about some medical procedures and not on others. And that's why it's really important that the communication is done properly and that the health care provider and any other people in that person's uh, support circle is able to sit down with them and give that information in a way they understand. Because again, on a decision-by-decision -decision basis, sometimes people will be able to give consent and not others. And going back to what I said right at the beginning, it's important that people with intellectual disabilities be as involved in their medical decisions as possible. And that means that they're going to be able to give consent to some and not others. So what you're saying is that there's no diagnosis such as intellectual disability that makes a person automatically ineligible to give informed consent. That's right. You should never, uh, no one should ever assume that because somebody has a particular diagnosis or a particular label of intellectual disability, that means they're incapable of making medical decisions. And if, and if you hear that from a healthcare provider or others, you really have to um, uh, push back and you really have to say, wait a minute, the fact that somebody has an intellectual disability doesn't mean they can't uh, give consent. It has to be looked at decision by decision, case by case, person by person. So if a person with significant cognitive disabilities cannot make a decision about their health care, how will decisions be made? Well, that's where uh, substituted decision making comes in. And so there are going to be people who can't make any decisions. Uh, there are going to be people who can make some decisions and not others. And there are going to be people who can make all sorts of decisions. So for the group of people who can't make some decisions, uh, the law has set up a process and a system by which substituted decision makers are, are named and are able to make decisions for them. And in the healthcare context, they come in basically three areas. Uh, there's a, a healthcare uh, agent, there's what's known as a healthcare representative, and then the most restrictive type, of course, you'd be a guardian. And a guardian can be appointed to somebody to make medical decisions. So if you've been named a guardian for somebody and you are authorized to make medical decisions, then you are, of course, their substitute decision maker. But guardianship is the most extreme form of substitute decision making. And in the healthcare context, there are less um, invasive, less formal mechanisms by which to provide substituted decision making. As I say, the healthcare advance directive, healthcare agent, and healthcare representative. What exactly is an advanced healthcare directive? An advanced healthcare directive is simply a written document in which you set forth what medical decisions you want made for you in the event that you're unable to make those decisions for yourself and you get to name who you want to make those decisions for you. So you sit down in advance while you're capable of making these decisions and say in the event that something happens to me and I'm unable to make my own decisions, maybe I'm unconscious, uh, uh, maybe I'm at, at the end of life um, and I'm unable to make decisions, then here's what I want from me. Here are the type of procedures I want and importantly, here are the type of procedures I don't want. And you write that out and you list it in, in a very straightforward way and then you name somebody who's your healthcare agent to implement those decisions for you. And so it's a very effective tool and one that we all should have whether you have a disability or not because you just don't know when you're going to be in a situation where you're unable to make decisions. So everybody uh, should have a healthcare advance directive because the law allows you to decide for yourself what decisions you want made in the event that you're unable to make those decisions for yourself. What is the difference between a living will and a power of attorney? There are two different documents that deal with two different stages of people's um, medical situation. A living will applies to an end-of-life situation where you're near the end of life 
and you make certain decisions about how you want to be treated when further medical care might be, um, might be futile. So people make decisions about um, uh, they want certain types of pain medication to control any pain they might be in. It might be they want uh, water, uh, they want food, they want to um, uh, uh, be kept comfortable as much as possible. So you articulate very specifically what treatment you would want at the end of life uh, uh, as you uh, are getting to the point where you're about to die. And it also, again, who gets to make those decisions for you. And a, a healthcare power of attorney uh, really deals with uh, this time period before you get to the end of life, which is, of course, as I just said, covered by the living will. So the healthcare power of attorney, anyone could have at any time. You might be perfectly healthy and you say, but in the event that I'm unable to make my own healthcare decisions for whatever reason, I want somebody to make those for me. So it's really the difference between the two is what stage in your medical situation uh, are you in. And so the living will, again, applies to end of life situations and the healthcare power of attorney applies to other times during your life. Can a person who has a cognitive disability make an advanced health care directive? Well, again, that's going to depend on the person, and it's going to depend on their abilities and inabilities. And so what has to happen is an, an, a, a decision has to be made uh, of the, about the person, about whether they are able to understand what it is that they're giving up in the sense that they're allowing another person to make their health care decisions. And if the person understands that they're having somebody else make their health care decisions for them in the event they're unable to make them for themselves, then yes, they're able to make advanced health care directives. But if the person is not able to do that because of their disability, then the advanced health care directive would not be valid and they can't do it. So again, this has to be de evaluated on a person-by-person -person basis given the, that person's relative strengths and weaknesses uh, when it comes to their um, intellectual capability. What happens when a person with a cognitive disability who was unable to or did not make an advanced health care directive and needs health care that requires informed consent? Well, that's a good question because uh, until the last few years, uh, there weren't any other options besides the advanced health care directive, which a person with intellectual disability might not be able to do, and guardianship, which of course can be an expensive and draw drawn out legal procedure. So a few years ago in Pennsylvania, a new law was put into place. It's called Act 169. And under that act, they created something called a health care representative. And a health care representative is somebody who can act as the substitute decision maker for medical decisions for somebody with an intellectual disability who either hasn't done an advanced directive or who is, does not have the capacity to do an advanced directive. So this new category of decision makers was created called a health care representative, and that person is empowered to make those medical decisions for somebody with an intellectual disability who's unable to make that decision for himself or herself. So how does a health care representative differ from a health care agent? Well, remember, a health care agent is somebody who has been specifically designated by the person who's done the health care advance directive. So, for example, if you were doing a, an advanced health care directive, you would appoint a health care agent. It might be your wife. It might be one of your adult children, for example. That's something that's very commonly done. So you have designated the health care agent. A health care representative is somebody who is, is named to do this who hasn't been appointed by the individual with the intellectual disability because they're unable to do an advanced health care directive or they haven't done an advanced health care directive. And so that's the difference. The difference is the health care agent is somebody the pers a person has specifically appointed to do the job of medical decision making and a health care representative is somebody who's later named to do that when it's clear that the person with the disability is unable to make medical decisions. What types of decisions can a health care representative make? Well, that's a great question, and it's unfortunately one that's not 100% clear under the law. So if you read the statute, which is, as I say, known as Act 169, health care representatives described as having certain powers that seem to relate to end-of-life situations. And so just reading the statute, you might think a health care representative can only make decisions for somebody when that person is in an end-of-life situation. The Department of Public Welfare, 
which deals with a lot of programs with people with intellectual disabilities, as well as many medical providers uh, believe, however, that a healthcare representative is empowered to make all different types of medical decisions. And so in many situations, uh, healthcare providers are honoring the decisions made by healthcare representatives in situations that don't involve the end of life. So um, the uh, Many have t are taking a broad view of what healthcare representatives can do, which is all healthcare decisions that require informed consent for people with intellectual disabilities who are unable to give that consent for themselves and remember and don't have their own advanced healthcare directives. So while the answer is not 100% clear, um, uh, in most situations it appears that healthcare providers in practice are allowing healthcare representatives to make decisions um, in all different types of medical situations that require informed consent. Can a healthcare representative refuse necessary life preserving treatment for someone? You know, I'm glad you asked that because this is an important area and it's one that can get a little complicated. So let me take a minute and see if I can ex explain it. Um, there are two different types of treatment they talk about in the law. One is called life sustaining treatment which is treatment that might be necessary to sustain people at the end of life. And then there's what's known as life-preserving treatment. And that's treatment that people might need, uh, but they're not an end-of-life situation, but they need it for their medical care. And if they don't get it, they could deteriorate and become either very ill or ultimately die. So the question you asked is whether a healthcare representative uh, can refuse to consent to life-preserving treatment. That is not the end-of-life situation, but the other situation. And the answer to that question is no. A healthcare representative um, can't refuse to consent to life preserving treatment. And so if they do and refuse to give that consent, the hospital or the medical uh, providers can override that and basically uh, not follow that directive. So if somebody really needs, somebody with intellectual disability, cognitive disability, um, requires life-preserving treatment, maybe it's surgery that if they don't get it will lead to a very significant and serious situation, for example, the healthcare representative is not permitted to refuse to consent to life-preserving treatment. In contrast, at the end of life, life-sustaining treatment, there's a different set of rules which we'll talk about. So who can act as a healthcare representative? Almost anyone can be a healthcare representative, and what the law does is create essentially a hierarchy of people who should be asked to be the healthcare representative. And so um, a person can name a healthcare representative if they have the ability to do that and they write it in a, a letter or they put it in an advanced. Um, uh, some sort of instruction. It wouldn't be an advanced directive necessarily because then you'd have a health care agent. But somebody could say, for example, make it clear to their family and friends that if I'm ever in this situation, I want my brother to be my health care representative. But unless it's very clear who the person wants and, and the person's able to make such a d distinction or m such a decision, um, the law creates a hierarchy and they go through a list. And it's a fairly long list, but it basically they'll look and see does the person have a spouse and will the spouse do it? And if that won't do it, does the person have adult children and will that person do it? And they go down the list sort of through a, a, a sort of a circle of relatives. If ultimately no one is available to do it or no one is willing to do it, the last category is a person who uh, knows the individual involved and has some uh, understanding of what their preferences were perhaps, what their religious values are, et cetera. So virtually almost anybody could be a health care representative, but for the most part the law is written in such a way to try and encourage close family members and others who really know the person and are able to make decisions that they think that person would have made. Now is there anyone who cannot act as a health care representative? There's really just two categories of people who can't do it, and one is um, a person's own physician can't be the health care representative, and that pretty much makes sense because obviously that person would be somewhat in a conflicted situation about their they're, they're not only prescribing the treatment, but then they would make a decision about whether the person would take the treatment. And then the other category of people who can't be health care representatives, if the person with the intellectual cognitive disability um, has a provider, so the provider or an employee of the provider, maybe it's a residential provider or a day program type of provider. So if you're employed by uh, an entity that is providing services to the individual with a disability, you can't be that person's health care representative. So are you saying that um a person with disabilities who has known the employees of a provider for years cannot have one of them be their health care representative? 
Well, you know, that's, that's a great point, right? Because a lot of people, if they don't have family, and even if they do, spend an awful lot of time with the staff of providers and oftentimes form, uh, you know, close relationships. And a lot of people um, maybe don't agree with this policy decision, but the decision that was made when they wrote this law, this uh, Act 169, was that uh, providers and their staff can't be health care representatives. And people can debate the wisdom of that. People, I could certainly make arguments as to why that's a bad idea. I think you can make arguments as to why that's probably not a bad idea. Uh, but the reality is, is that the way the law was written is that the providers and their staffs are just not eligible to be a health care representative. And so that decision has been made. People may disagree, but there's very little option that, that we have at this point. Now, I will say that there's a separate statute that's uh, what's called the Intellectual Disability and Mental Health Act, and that was passed in 1966. And under that statute, um, what are known as facility directors um, are given the power to make decisions, medical decisions, in certain circumstances for people who are in residential programs. And those uh, folks have to um, not have anybody else who can make decisions, and there have to be at least two independent doctors who are recommending a particular course of action. And so if there's nobody able to make that decision, uh, the uh, Mental Health and Intellectual Disability Act does empower these facility directors to make the medical decision. Um, and uh, the Department of Public Welfare has long interpreted that statute to include individual uh, homes, group homes, small residents, to be uh, a facility for purposes of this, which seems to allow the head of those provider agencies to make medical decisions. So there's some conflict in the law. On the one hand, you have one law that says providers can't do it, and then there's another law that says, in some circumstances, providers can do it. And so for the most part, what DPW has said, the Department of Public Welfare has argued is, and I think it's been accepted, is that in those circumstances covered by the Mental Health and Intellectual Disability Act, that the facility directors can make medical decisions when there's nobody else to make a decision for the person. If there is a court-appointed guardian to make health care decisions, is it the guardian who makes the health care decision, or is it the health care representative or health care agent? If a person has a guardian and also has a health care advance directive naming an agent, um, the first question you have to ask is, does the guardianship include the power to make medical decisions? Because not all guardianships do. Some guardianships are limited to financial decisions or they're limited to some other types of decisions. So the first thing to look at is, is the guardian empowered to make medical decisions? And then if the guardian is empowered to make medical decisions, then the health care agent is answerable to the guardian in the same way they would be answerable to the individual involved. And where this means on a very practical level is, is that if the guardian wanted to replace the health care agent, the guardian can do so. But what the guardian can't do is change the health care directions within the advanced health care directive. See what I mean? So if you did a, a advanced health care directive and said, I want the following five types of treatment and I don't want the following five types of treatment, and I name my brother as my health care agent, if I became your guardian at some point later, I could replace your brother as the health care agent. But what I can't do, except if I get court approval, is somehow change your wishes as to what medical care you want and what medical care you don't want. So the answer really to your question is that the guardian ultimately can only decide who makes the decision, less about changing what your wishes are. I think I understand what you're saying. This is a lot of information to remember. It is a lot of information, and it's important information, obviously. At one time or another, this is likely to impact most, if not all, of us in terms of making medical decisions for ourselves, for our family members, et cetera. So it's important that we have good information. So uh, it's going to be very difficult to uh, know all you need to know just from my answering your questions. So fortunately, there's a lot of good information out there at the website of the Disability Rights Network. Uh, we have a publication that talks about these issues in more detail, and there are other places you can also get information. So it's important that for all of us to, to make sure we're as knowledgeable about this as we possibly can be, given how important an issue it really is. Well, thank you all very much for coming and um, letting me answer your questions. I'm going to hang out for a little bit afterwards, so if any of you want to talk further about an issue or have a specific situation that you want to talk to me about, I'd be happy to do that for you. So uh, thank you for coming, and as I say, I'm going to hang out a little bit, and uh, maybe I'll talk to you more. Thanks.
couple of uh, personal questions that I would like to ask you. You had asked to sit down with me and go over a few other issues that you said you had, which I'm happy to do. So how, how can I help you with, with, with your questions? Thank you very much, Mark. My daughter, she has significant cognitive disabilities. Yeah. She cannot make a decision about her medical care. She cannot give informed consent. So should I become her guardian? Should I attempt to do that officially? You know, that's probably the most frequent question we get from parents in your situation. Uh, their son or daughter is turning 18 and they think, do I have to become the guardian? Or uh, some issue happens around medical care and they think, well, gee, who's going to be able to make decisions for her in the future? Should I become the guardian? And our general advice is to analyze the situation uh, very carefully and make sure that guardianship is really the solution to the problem uh, that exists. And so, for example, in the medical decision-making context, you can be her health care representative and make decisions for her that way because she's not able to make decisions for herself. So when it comes to medical decisions, for example, you don't need to be the guardian. And to be the health care representative really doesn't require much at all. You get to do it because you're her parent and involved in her life. Guardianship, for example, is a legal proceeding. You've got to get a lawyer. It can be costly. So there usually are just as effective cheaper, more convenient techniques to become a substitute decision maker if people really think through the situation. Now there are some times when you, people do have to become guardians for their sons or daughters, but it shouldn't happen automatically and you just need to think carefully and make sure. And as I say in the medical context, as the healthcare representative, there's no reason when it comes to medical decision making that you need to be her guardian. Now what about emergencies? Suppose that she is like unconscious and none of her representatives are available, then what happens? That's not a problem either because the law presumes that people give consent for emergency. So if she really were in an emergency situation, she was rushed to the hospital, you weren't around, there was nobody else to help her out, a family member, the doctors there would presume that she gives consent to get stabilized, deal with the immediate issue, and only after that when there might be further treatment indicated when you've had a chance to arrive, then you can become the, the decision maker if that's what you do. But you don't have to worry about emergencies. There's always legal consent to treat somebody in an emergency situation. Okay. Now, I've heard about something called DNR. Mm -hmm. What is that? A DNR is a do not resuscitate order. And what that means is that the person who issues the DNR order is basically saying that in the event that I go into cardiac arrest and I don't want to be uh, resuscitated, I don't want the EMTs who come to help me to actually help me. And uh, so um, that's a, you know, obviously a serious thing and people have to think carefully about that and so there are lots of issues associated with it, but that's what it is. It's basically saying if I get into that situation, I don't want to be resuscitated and brought back to the, my former place. Now, when is a DNR officially issued? Right, and that's really the key, is that when you can do it and under what circumstances. So if you're the substitute decision maker for someone else, say you're the health care representative for your daughter, you can only do a DNR for her to the extent that she's in an end-of-life situation. So you could issue a DNR order if she's in an end-of-life situation, that would be part of her medical records and the hospital staff or the doctors who are taking care of her at that point will realize it's there. And if something were to happen to her when she was in the end-of-life situation, that DNR order would be honored. And the theory being that, of course, if someone's truly at the end of life, you don't resuscitate someone just so they could linger a little bit longer. However, if she's not in an end-of-life situation, if she's living her life normally and, and is just going through life as all of us are, you as the substitute decision maker are not allowed to issue a DNR order for her in that situation. It has to be in an end-of-life situation. Okay. Well, that was a very helpful explanation. I think I understand things a little bit better. Mark, thank you so much. Thank really you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. If you have additional questions or need more information about healthcare decision making or other types of substitute decision making, please visit our website at www.drnpa.org to access DRN's guide, Consent, Capacity, and Substitute Decision Making, as well as other videos in this series.